Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. I just want to let all those who listen to this podcast through Facebook know that I am leaving the social media giant. Let me be a little blunt about the reason for my decision. I don't mean to sound strange or extreme but I'm weary of the communist kind of control Facebook has over people. I refuse to submit to their hyper-liberal agenda that's in keeping with a one-world government. In my opinion, to submit to them is to support them, and that's something I don't want to do. In our study of John's first epistle, we looked at his teaching on the Antichrist spirit that defines this world, and Facebook is the epitome of this Antichrist spirit. If Christians refuse to stand against this big tech giant and its horrendous censorship, then how are we going to stand against the growing persecution that the church is experiencing? If people that claim to be Christian are enslaved to social media, what else are they enslaved to and what has it done to their spiritual and moral life? I have not totally abandoned social media. I have moved over to MeWe.com, which is a conservative alternative to the hyper-liberal Facebook. I have a very small following on this platform, but my reach is virtually the same as Facebook. For years I have managed my personal and ministry pages to keep them near the friend limit by asking people to follow me instead. If I could have had more than the 5,000 limit of friends on Facebook, I would have had 20 to 30,000 friends, and I'm not exaggerating here. Out of all my friends, each week my reach on Facebook is around 50 people, yet I have 5,000 friends. Why is this? They want money for advertising to increase people's fear of influence, even among their friends. There have been times when my ministry page has been suspended over my podcast, and I am never given a reason. Yet it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand their motivation. The spirit of Antichrist that defines Facebook is hostile to Jesus and the Holy Spirit that defines those who are true disciples of Christ. Well, enough said on this. I just wanted people to know that I'm leaving Facebook and why I'm doing so. Please follow me on MeWe, which is a far better social media platform than Facebook since it doesn't have the communist kind of KGB control that Facebook has. Now let's jump into our study. 1 John chapter 5 verses 2 through 5 was the focus of our last lesson. In those verses we saw a transition from John's teaching on love to that of faith and victory. Starting with verse 5, the apostle expands his thought on faith and victory by becoming more theological in the formal sense of the idea. Every time we read our Bible, listen to preaching and teaching, or talk to others about Jesus, we are engaging in theology. The word theology is a combination of two words, theos, which means God, and ology, which is to study. So, theology is just the study of God. There's formal theology that you get in Bible school or seminary, and there's practical, everyday kind of theology that Christians should be engaged in every day of their life. Though John is getting a little more formal, He is still writing these truths in a way that average people can understand. As we look at John's theological statements, we will actually find that it would be better to refer to them as Christological, which is a branch of theology that focuses upon the divinity and humanity of Christ. The importance of this has to do with the object of our faith, as I mentioned when we closed our last lesson. It's not faith that saves, but faith in the only one that can save. Jesus is the only Savior. Faith can't save in the strict sense of the idea, nor can the Bible. The Bible points us to the Savior, and by placing our faith in the God revealed in Scripture, we can be saved by the Savior. When the Bible states that we are saved by faith, we must understand that our faith must rest upon the only one that can save sinners from their sins. This is why John stated in verse 5, Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Victory over self, sin, Satan, and the world comes through faith in Jesus. True saving faith causes us to trust the Lord with our entire being. Therefore, saving faith is an all-consuming faith and not merely an intellectual or emotional response. Here's the challenge concerning faith. Our faith must be in the biblical Jesus, not in a make-believe Jesus as the byproduct of lukewarm American Christianity that's mingled with worthless opinions. To create a God out of opinions is no less idolatry than bowing down to an image of Satan, Buddha, or Molech, because they all belong to the same demonic source. And it's irrelevant if some people happen to call their false God Jesus. 
Idolatry will always be hateful to the true and living God because it's counterfeit and antichrist. If we want to be true worshipers of God, then we must know Him according to His self-disclosure, and not according to opinions or doctrines made by men and even devils. We must also learn what He has clearly revealed and how we are to properly approach Him who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is extremely important. If we long to know the person and work of God as revealed in Scripture, then we will want to know how to approach God in a way that's acceptable to Him. People that think they can approach God any way they want and according to their own preferences are terribly deceived and filled with raw arrogance. There's an acceptable way to approach God who is infinite in holiness, and this is revealed in Scripture. The Word of God also teaches us what isn't acceptable to Him, and everything that isn't acceptable to Him is antagonistic to His holy nature. King David declared in Psalms 24, verses 3 and 4, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. To attempt to approach the Lord in an unacceptable manner is not only arrogant, but thoroughly stupid. Please don't take an offense at my use of the word stupid, since I am only using a biblical thought. King Solomon stated in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Then Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 25, So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate, and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things, and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. This actually was an integral part of Solomon's demise who abused the gift of wisdom God gave him, which was to be used for the glory of God, and instead he used it in the pursuit of the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. We are told in Psalms 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. To think that we can approach God any way we want and use gifts any way we desire is really stupid, yet people do this all the time to their own eternal ruin. To quote King David again, but this time it's Psalms 15 that reads, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill, he whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and cast no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury, and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. By understanding that God is infinitely holy and loving, will help us to approach God in a way that's pleasing to him. While ignorance of this truth will cause people to be rejected by him, regardless of how religious they may be. John, addressing this issue in his unique manner, was endeavoring to help us understand that Jesus is God, and as such, we must approach him in a way that's acceptable and pleasing to him. Paul deals with this issue throughout his writings. One such portion of Scripture is found in Romans 12, verse 1, that states, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The King James translated it as reasonable service rather than as our spiritual act of worship. Both translations are correct and both emphasize a different point. Yet both are addressing the issue on how to acceptably approach God. And the only way we can approach Him is if we do what pleases Him. Paul went on to write in verse 2, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's where the promise comes in. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul is taking what the Old Testament thought on how to approach God in an acceptable manner to a much deeper level. The verses I quoted from King David speak about some outward acts that are acceptable to God, all of which come out of a pure heart, which addresses the condition of the person's inward life in God. But Paul addresses the absolute necessity that we live surrendered to God as living sacrifices, and this reveals that our relationship with God must be all-consuming. The Lord Jesus Christ will not accept half-hearted devotion. Evidence of true surrender to Jesus is seen not in conforming to the world, which is defined by the Antichrist spirit I mentioned in my opening points. The only kind of surrender that's acceptable to God is that which is all-consuming, where our heart, mind, and will are yielded to the Savior. For people to not be conformed to this world, they must have their mind transformed. Until we think differently, we won't act differently. We don't need a little fixing up of our way of thinking and the way we live, 
but we need a total revolution of our mind because our natural mind is thoroughly corrupt and depraved. To be pleasing to God, we must be a living sacrifice that's not conformed to this world, and this can only happen when we begin to think like bona fide followers of Jesus. This is the only kind of people that will know God's good and pleasing will and experience the phenomenal blessings such a life produces. When the ambition of our life is to please God in everything we are and do, then we will learn what is pleasing and displeasing to Him. We will then put into practice those things that please Him and aggressively avoid those things that incur His displeasure. This is love for God, as John extensively teaches in this epistle. Here's where biblical literacy is killing the church, and I don't mean that figuratively, but literally. America's obsession with screens has helped create this biblical illiteracy by people willfully allowing themselves to be manipulated through their screens. In our supposed modern culture, a vast number of people don't read or read very much due to the reading habits of those addicted to their screens. People may read a sentence or two off of a blog or news site or read a little blurb off of social media. Some might even read a novel from an app they have downloaded, but to faithfully read the Bible is being forsaken by vast portions of the church, especially the younger generations. If we don't know God's Word, then how are we going to know how to be saved, what it means to be saved, and how to stay saved. Not just that, how will people know what pleases and displeases God? This means that they have no knowledge on how to approach God in an acceptable manner. They are like dumb sheep following other dumb sheep, all of which are defined by opinions and what the mass of self-professing Christians are saying and doing. Ignorance of God's word is literally damning multitudes to hell, even while they claim to be Christian and many still going to church. As we begin digging into verse 6, John will add a little substance to what we are to believe about the person of God incarnate, Jesus, the Son of God. I want to begin by reading verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. With the next three verses, there are a lot of diverse ideas from Bible commentators. Some of the scholars and preachers get so allegorical in their interpretation that they miss what John is actually teaching. The allegorical interpretation of Scripture was by and large abandoned after the Reformation, though there is a growing number of preachers and teachers that use it today. This approach to understanding the Scriptures and teaching it can get off the wall because it moves away from the plain meaning of the text to make it teach what the individual wants rather than what the author taught. This isn't a faithful rendering of the Word of God, and should not be used except in rare circumstances. As we dig into these three verses, we will try to understand what John is striving to communicate, rather than focus on the strange ideas some commentators teach. The first thing we must understand is that John is teaching on Jesus being the Son of God, so these three verses address this issue. By the time John wrote this epistle, there were false teachers propagating lies about Christ's divinity or humanity, or at times even both. Since salvation depends upon believing the truth, John needed to set things right by teaching on both our Lord's humanity and divinity. He does this in different ways in these verses, but nonetheless, this is what we are given by John, and so we must do our best to understand what he's trying to communicate. The first thing we have to do is grasp what he means by, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. His use of the name and title Jesus Christ helps us with this because it reveals that he is addressing Jesus as the Messiah. It seems best to see the water as the beginning of Christ's ministry as Messiah and blood as the end of his mission as Messiah. That Jesus came by water is when his ministry was inaugurated by his baptism in the Jordan. At that moment he received the Father's testimony as to both his Messiahship and divine sonship. In Matthew chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 we find the account. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he, referring to John the Baptist, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We see here at the beginning of our Lord's ministry, where he was baptized by John the Baptist, that the Father spoke from heaven, declaring the Eternal Son, and the Holy Spirit was giving affirmation as well with his presence. John the Baptist testifies of this, stating in John chapter 1, verses 29-34, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, 
A man who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen, and I testify, that this is the Son of God. In verse 30, John gave clear evidence to Christ's divinity by stating that the one who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. At this point, according to Christ's earthly life, he was six months younger than his cousin John. We must also make note that Jesus hadn't even begun his ministry while John was at its height. So the only way we can faithfully understand what the Baptist meant is in relation to the pre-existence of Christ as God. Within the verses I just read, we hear from John that the Father who called and sent John communed with him that the Messiah would have the Holy Spirit descend and stay on him, and that's exactly what happened to Jesus. After all this, I think it's safe to say that the water refers to Christ's baptism. As to the blood, I think it's reasonable to assert that it's in reference to our Lord's crucifixion. We are told in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. This was the principal reason for Jesus being our atoning sacrifice, so that by his substitutionary atonement, we, who are sinners by nature and by choice, could be forgiven and reconciled to God. The Apostle John recorded in his Gospel, in John chapter 19, verse 30, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What work had Jesus finished on the cross? Through his messianic work, the law was fulfilled, his obedience accomplished, the Old Testament prophecies fulfilled, and redemption for mankind obtained. Through this work, mankind could enter into the most holy place to fellowship with the infinitely holy God, because the blood of Christ is more than enough to cleanse repentant sinners and make them holy and acceptable to God. An interesting thought that corresponds to Messiah's water and blood is that these are two sacraments Christians are commanded to celebrate. Water baptism is meant to be a one-time event after salvation has come to the soul. It's to be a public testimony that people have gone from spiritual death to spiritual life in Christ. Communion is a memorial to celebrate throughout the life of true believers what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. The next point John makes in verse 6 is, He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. John the Baptist was known to Israel to be a genuine prophet. He baptized people in water unto repentance, but he didn't die for the sins of the people because he wasn't the promised Messiah. Jesus was baptized by water and blood, a double baptism. The first to inaugurate his ministry, the second to finish his work of redemption. The third and final point in verse 6 is, And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. As we looked at earlier, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the Father spoke audibly from heaven, and the Holy Spirit descended in physical form, resting upon Jesus. Here's a trinity in one of the clearest examples in Scripture, where the oneness of God reveals the unity within the trinity. There was never a time where Jesus testified by himself. The Father and Spirit were always there. How could it be otherwise? We see this wonderfully laid out in John chapter 3, verse 34. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives him the Spirit without limit. All the miracles Jesus performed was done in obedience to the Father's will, but according to the inherent power Jesus possesses as Almighty God. Yet there was never a miracle done by himself or for himself, but they were all done in perfect unity of the Trinity. I have been in authentic revival and have seen the power of God fall in tremendous ways. How much more was this a reality when Jesus preached? So we could say that as Jesus spoke, ministered, and was among the people, the Holy Spirit was moving and testifying to who Jesus was. There has never been a man, nor could there ever be another, except Jesus who was given the Spirit without limit. One aspect of this is that he was sinless, so there was nothing in him to grieve the Father of the Holy Spirit. But even more than that, he was God incarnate. And in this sense, the Spirit was given to him without measure because of the perfect unity within the Trinity. With everything Jesus did, the Spirit upheld him by testifying through the wonder of the Spirit's presence in ways that most people can't understand because they have never experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
There's another application that can be seen with those who give the verifiable evidence that they are followers of Jesus and have, out of obedience to the command, been baptized in water and regularly celebrate the Lord's Supper. This proof is the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit that every true believer has. For if they don't have the Spirit living in them, then they don't belong to Jesus. This is different from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I will leave that teaching for another day and recommend that you watch my video teaching on the subject off my website or from my YouTube channel. The Lord wants His people to be so full of the Holy Spirit that the Spirit is testifying through them to the reality that we belong to Jesus and that Jesus is God. There are many ways this can happen, from conviction over sin to a divine magnetism that supernaturally draws people to fall at the feet of Jesus in repentance and surrender. One of the major problems a church in America has today is that she is so full of self that she is empty of the Holy Spirit. It's like the Old Testament where you had the tabernacle the Lord commanded Moses to build that was in Shiloh. But the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. It wasn't in the most holy place like it should be. This is an expression of the house of God without the presence of God. That's dead religion, having a form of godliness, but utterly powerless because it's without the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is church without God present in any tangible way, and this is a tragedy beyond what words can convey. It's a modern-day version of the Valley of Dry Bones that Ezekiel prophesied about in chapter 37 of his prophetic book. As we move on to verses 7 and 8, we find that there are a lot of diversity in translations and commentaries. As I have stated before, the division of chapter and verses isn't original to the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. In a limited number of cases, this can cause translators a lot of trouble in how to translate a verse or portion of Scripture, and this is a case in point. Not just that. There is a possibility that some of the translations are using manuscripts that were edited. I don't want to get deep into this because none of the differences change what John is teaching, but I will try to explain this in simple terms. I think the best way to do this is to read a couple of the translations so that we can see the differences. Let's begin with the 1984 NIV, going from the end of verse 6 through verse 8. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Now let's look at the King James Version. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Another translation called the Oracle, or the Living Oracle, was first published in 1824 and gives a little different twist to it, and I will read verses 6 through 8. This is he who came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not the water only, but by the water and the blood. And it is the Spirit who testified, because the Spirit is the truth. Indeed, there are three who bear testimony, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. The Oracle New Testament is seen by some as the granddaddy of modern translations in that it was an attempt to make the language of Scripture understandable to the average people of their day. The translator also used older manuscripts as their source material, which made it more accurate than the King James Version. Yet those who are bound up in the King James-only teaching don't consider that older manuscripts shed a lot of light on the Word. The distinction that the King James makes between three that bear witness in heaven and three that bear witness on earth appears to be an insertion of an editor, and not original according to the oldest manuscripts. The evidence against the rendering of these verses according to the King James Version is rather overwhelming. This wasn't removed from more modern translations out of some deviant act of compromise but from striving to be accurate by using older source material than what the translators of the King James Version had. When the editor's insertion are removed, verses 6 through 9 flow much better and make perfect sense. For this reason, I will use a 1984 NIV to finish up this lesson on verses 7 and 8. In verse 7, we are told that there are three who testify or bear witness that Jesus is the Son of God. And it would be helpful for us to understand that there's no distinction made in ancient manuscripts between heaven and earth in these verses. Of course, the Father, Son, and Spirit gave evidence to Jesus being Messiah and the Son of God, and we have already touched on this. According to the Mosaic Law, two or three witnesses were needed to constitute an adequate testimony. Even Jesus used this point of the law to support his claim of being Messiah and for performing miracles. 
Heaven doesn't need testimony of Christ's divinity because there's no dispute there as to his person and nature. It's on earth before an unbelieving and obstinate world that the testimony is needed. So according to the 1984 NIV, verse 7 declares that there are three that bear witness to Jesus, and in verse 8 the apostle reveals who these witnesses are. Verse 8 declares, The Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. The three agree or testify that Jesus is the Son of God, and as such, He is the promised Messiah. We mustn't miss or forget that the purpose of these few verses is to support and testify to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Though there is a reasonable way to apply these truths to the life of believers, they must first be applied to Jesus. The first in the list is the Holy Spirit who has testified and is still testifying that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God, and is equal with the Father within the Trinity. No one will seek a Savior until they understand their need of a Savior and know who that Savior is. This is the work of the Holy Spirit who uses every means in keeping with His nature as God to bring people to salvation. The Spirit uses Scripture, trials, the consequences of sin, and even people to glorify the Eternal Son. Without the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting sinners of their sin and of informing them that Jesus is the only remedy to their sin-sick souls, no one can be saved. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is another expression of the love of God that's lavished upon us, to use some of John's terminology. It's not just that we need the Holy Spirit to be saved, but we need His work in our life to stay saved. The Spirit is constantly speaking to the heart and mind of believers to reaffirm who Jesus is and to glorify the Eternal Son, to convict of sin, and to be our comforter and guide. We need to return to the point that the second witness to the person and work of Jesus was His water baptism. That was the inauguration of His ministry. The third testimony to Christ's Sonship is the blood, which was poured out on Calvary's tree so that we could be saved. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin, as Paul taught in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. The Spirit, the water, and the blood testify in perfect unity to the divinity and humanity of Christ as our promised Messiah. These three are at work in this world testifying to Christ so that people can be saved. And these three testify through true followers of Jesus. Water baptism speaks of the testimony we have in becoming one of Christ's disciples, Communion testifies that we are in fellowship with Him and that His blood cleanses us from sin. And third, the Holy Spirit dwelling in believers speaks that we belong to Jesus. Is this testimony in you, dear listener? Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Let healing walk